Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with an old friend, William Overholt. And I must say, uh, he is the man who awakened my interests and helped me become acquainted in China going back to around 1990. Dr. Overholt is a senior research fellow at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. He's written nine books. I remember dearly The Rise of China from 1993 and uh, China's Crisis of Success, a new book uh, a couple of years ago in Remimbi Rising. He's a formidable, formidable presence, lived 18 years in Hong Kong, was the former president of the Flung Global Institute, which was, you know, I must say, my favorite Asian think tank. And... Uh, Bill, I just, uh, I'm delighted that we could get come here today and discuss things related to China, what's recently happened in Hong Kong, the pandemic. Uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, Rob, it's an honor to, to be here with you today. Um, I think the overall theme of U.S.-China relations is that uh, the U.S., doesn't want to grant China a place at the big people's table. And China uh, is an adolescent power trying to be uh, arbiter of the new global system and at the same time playing the victim and uh, trying to get all the advantages of being a child. But let me go to the foundations of what's happening and start with the economy. Uh, the U.S. Uh, and the world can tolerate uh, uh, countries that are young and growing up uh, being protectionist. Uh, but they get to the point where they're affecting the whole world. We went through this with Japan. Uh, uh, we nurtured Japan. We, we, we allowed them to uh, protect their industries and undervalue their currency and uh, subsidize. Uh, and, and then it got to the point where Japan was a really big power. And it was it was affecting the whole world, and, and and we had to get really tough and tell them, "You get our big boy now. Uh, you have to play by the rules." And we put ten percent tariffs on them. We we had all sorts of restrictive uh, uh, marketing agreements with them, but they made the transition, and that's where China is today. Uh, we have two really big economic problems with China. Uh, one is intellectual property theft. Uh, Xi Jinping promised Barack Obama that uh, th this would be banned, uh, and it went down for a while, and it's right back up there. They're, they're stealing all our most important technologies, and that's just an unacceptable but the really big issue is market access. Now, why is that a, such a big issue? Well, with China's current scale, you have a company like Huawei that feels it should have the opportunity to take over the whole world market for 5G. And 5G is going to be the foundation of our lives. Uh, uh, and their competitors are two European companies, Ericsson and Nokia. Uh, now, Huawei has had access to all the three big markets of the world, the US, the EU, and China, whereas Nokia and Ericsson are uh, restricted to a very small part of the Chinese market. So Huawei can afford a research and development budget that's more than Nokia and Ericsson combined. And given the 
the importance of technology, that means that Huawei can simply destroy Nokia and Ericsson, not because it's a better company, but because uh, it has access to the whole world market and the Europeans don't. The same thing is true in a much more basic technology of credit cards. Uh, many years ago, uh, China promised that Western credit card companies would get access to China, but they've restricted it. Uh, they haven't honored their promises. It's now UnionPay, the, the Chinese credit card company, has 38% of the world market. Uh, MasterCard only has about 20%. And uh, Visa has, I, I think, somewhere around 30. Don't, make, don't hold me to the exact number. So is Union Pay the biggest force in the world market because it's a better company? No. Uh, it, it's taking over world market share because it has access to all three major markets, and, and Visa and MasterCard are restricted. So, so Western companies just gradually die under this scenario. Uh, the only way the system continues to work is if China grows up and, and gives the market access that it's promised. And that market access has to be broadly into the service economy as well as the manufacturing economy. Uh, China has access for everything that it's good at, namely manufacturing, but it restricts access for almost everything that the U.S. is good at, namely services, uh, banking, uh, consulting, uh, accounting, and so forth. Uh, so we've got a real crisis here, and it has to be it has to be confronted very decisively, uh, and, and that means tough measures. Now, how has the the Trump administration handled this? Uh, well, first of all, the, the, the atmosphere in Washington changed because the business community changed from being a defender of China uh, when it was getting early access and making money to a, a being really angry at China. This is not just the U.S. businesses, but the European ones. Uh, while they're making money, they're so restricted in the China market that uh, China is still simply taking over the, the big world markets. And these, these companies were demanding that this problem be solved. So and in comes the, the Trump administration. Now, for the Trump administration, there, there are four issues. The, the two real issues, the intellectual property issue and the market access issue. And there are two completely phony issues. Uh, one is the currency. Uh, for years, the Chinese, current, the Chinese currency has been overvalued. Uh, so it actually inhibits Chinese exports. But Trump and, and other politicians of both parties go back a decade and use the most extreme uh, measures of undervaluation. Uh, and now oh, China's, China's manipulating its currency to destroy American jobs. Uh, it simply isn't true. Uh, it's exactly the opposite of the truth. But Trump has focused very much on that issue. And the other issue is uh, trade balance. Now, everyone who's taken first year economics knows that a country's overall trade balance is how much we save minus how much we spend. Uh, Americans save very little and they spend a lot, so they have a big trade deficit. Uh, Under Trump, the big tax cuts have meant we save a lot less than we used to, and we spend more than we used to. 
So our trade deficit goes through the roof. Uh, and that's a Trump problem. It's not a China problem. But leaning, leaning on China, you can force the trade balance to shift to other countries like Vietnam and Bangladesh, but you can't reduce the overall trade balance. Uh, Trump has focused on the two phony issues. Mm -hmm. Buy billions of dollars of, of soybeans to reduce the trade deficit. And by doing that, uh, he's neglected the issues that are important to American business. And, and instead of trying to solve the problems, he's created this Cold War atmosphere, which makes it very difficult to solve any problem. Uh, the, the Chinese have uh, not behaved better. Uh, they have been very intransigent on the major issues. The, the, the concessions they've offered uh, in some cases sound good, but, but uh, there are all sorts of ways to get around them with local regulations. So we've got an impasse. And uh, this is very hurtful to the American business community because the problems are, instead of solving the problems, the problems are becoming impossible to solve. Uh, and going back to my first comment, the basic, the basic problem on the Chinese side is that they're demanding the privileges of a, of, of a poor, underdeveloped country. They've got four of the world's 10 largest banks, but they use infant industry arguments to argue that they have the right to protect their, their financial system. Uh, they want one Huawei to be able to take over the world, but they're not going to allow anybody else to have comparable positions in, in the Chinese market. So we've got absolute Chinese unwillingness to grow up, and we've got a Trump administration that focusing on all the wrong issues and, and messing up the, the possibility of any, of, of, of any progress. On the national... I was going to say, Bill, I'm very inspired as I listen to you uh, because I follow a lot of the, you know, basically from your teaching me as a much younger person working in the currency markets. But what what I find really compelling is that these problems were cropping up. You know, people like uh, Blackwell and Kurt Campbell writing at the Council on Foreign Relations in 2014 and 15, before Trump was even campaigning, and the question of intellectual property, and the question of access to the market, or the combination of the both. You do foreign direct investment, and, it's, and miraculously, the Chinese who work with you create a competitive firm, and it starts to get all of the market share and access that Westerners had dreamed of. Wall Street thought we were going to make the renminbi convertible and modernize the Chinese market, and they would have access where you might say America's comparative advantage in providing fi uh, financial services. So, I and then I think something that was quite healthy, but nonetheless compressed the enthusiasm. American companies that had done foreign direct investments started seeing Chinese wages going up and environmental protections necessarily going up, and that compressed some of their profits at the margin. The coalition that what you might call lobbied America for integration with China and proceeding along the lines of a, uh, how would I say, a, a deeper and deeper interconnection just uh, it was falling apart before Trump came to town. And then what you say that Trump focused on the wrong things rather than the right things leaves us with lots of acrimony and what I'll call a deepening ditch. The China 2025 was, I believe, uh, a public document well before Trump came into power. 
And that notion of displacing knowledge intensive and higher up the value chain things with domestic production, I mean, it kind of reminded me of Orville Schell. He wrote that book uh, with, a, with a co-author, I think his name was Jury, uh, Wealth and Power, about how the Chinese, the former Middle Kingdom, had been wounded by the Opium Wars, wounded by the Japanese invasion. And there's a nationalism that wants to regain their preeminence. But that's, that's not compatible with the global system, at, at the, how you say, as the cards are being dealt right now. Yes. Uh, uh, manufac- I'm glad you brought up Manufacturing 2025 because uh, that's become a, a special bet noir for the, uh, the Trump administration. And there are issues on each side. One is uh, the Chinese view uh, the American right wing's desire for decoupling with China as as a threat. But the Chinese assertion that they're going to take over the market in every leading manufacturing technology uh, and replace the Westerners who now serve a large part of their market. That's a Chinese version of decoupling. And, and they, they started this process of decoupling, uh, this mentality of decoupling, long before it was uh, a thing at the Heritage Foundation. Um, the, the logic of decoupling makes no sense for either side. Uh, China is hugely dependent on foreign direct investment uh, for growth, for technology, for jobs. And uh, so decoupling makes no sense for their economy. On on our side, the decouplers focus on the supply side. They say, oh, we can't be dependent on China. Well, if you look at the demand side, Ch- China is the big market today. Uh, if you make cars, your biggest market is in China. If you're Gucci or Nike, your biggest market is in China. For three quarters of a century, the center of gravity of the world market has been the the Western baby boomer. Uh, Rob, that's you and me. And uh, we're getting long in the tooth. Now the center of gravity of the world market is is China. Uh, If we cut ourselves off from that, we're dead. Uh, I guess my, my analogy to that would be what happened to France. Uh, uh, when I was a kid, France was a great world power. Uh, if you were going to be anybody in international diplomacy or international business, you had to speak French. Uh, and f- France became just enough more protectionist than uh, places like the U.S. and Germany that it's global position went into radical decline. Uh, now it's it, it's a third rate power. Uh, and that's exactly what the US will do to itself uh, if if this mentality of, of decoupling is allowed to to prevail. So uh, we we have a big problem on this and the Chinese have a big uh, problem on this. Having, uh, having said that, uh, it's probably useful to switch for a minute to the national security side. Uh, and here you have the same phenomenon. Uh, China in the South China Sea is behaving as if it were a tiny little country like Malaysia, 
or Vietnam or the Philippines. And these countries play all sorts of little games. Uh, Anwar, who in, in his previous incarnation as deputy prime minister of Malaysia, used to fly out at midnight to these little islands on a helicopter and plant foreign artifacts uh, to show that Malaysia had always been in, in control of these islands. And uh, that's what small countries do. That's what China's doing. It's, it, it's, it's behaving like a small country, just grabbing everything it, it can. But as a big country, you have some responsibility to maintain the system. Uh, you need peace. You need rules that preserve the peace. You need a situation where countries have strong interests, but they recognize that other countries have strong interests too, and they need a system for compromise. China refuses all that and behaves be, behaves like a tiny power. Uh, uh, the U.S., on the other hand, uh, wants to treat China as if it were still a, a tiny power. When China says, we should have some say over uh, standards on digital digital commerce, where we're the world's leader. Or when China says we should have an agreement um, maintaining peace in space. Or when China says uh, we're a big economy now, we should have a proportionate role in the World Bank. It was no, 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 you're, you're, you're challenging our right to be the world hegemon, to control everything. Uh, yeah. That's not going to work in the modern world. Uh, there are, China's not the only country that's bigger than it used to be. India, Brazil, uh, in, in particular, are. So, uh, Somehow our congressmen in particular, and most of our political leaders, think that we have a God-given right to control everything. And that if some other country uh, thinks it should have a say, even in areas where it's the leading, the, the world leader, uh, that's unacceptable to us. So, so, uh, we Americans have to accept that, that, that China's a big power. It's going to be there indefinitely. It has a right to compete. It has a right to have a say in the world standards that are set. And, and when they ask for a voice, it, it, it is usually legitimate. Now, when they when they try to chair the U the UN Human Rights uh, Committee, that's unacceptable. Uh, we we have to fight for our standards <laughs> in areas like that. But th those areas are actually relatively relatively limited. I think, Bill, that uh, there are many things that are uh, which you might call coming from different philosophical traditions. And when I've met in recent years with some of the very top leaders in China, not Xi Jinping himself, but some of those right around him, people who you know, uh, they say to me, well, if we had been Tonga, we could have tied up to the tugboat called America, sent some of our people over for education, come back, modernized our economy, and we'd have been so small you wouldn't even have noticed. But when we're a country that has between four and five times the population of America, we start to what you might call sink the tugboat. But 
they didn't think that globalization necessarily would sink the tugboat. They thought that the Americans failed to take the logic of what economists call free trade theory seriously, which requires for everyone to be better off some compensation, some adjustment, some transformational assistance, and that the government and the money politics of the United States led to essentially rewarding the winners with tax cuts, deregulation, the right to keep your money offshore, and the losers saw their public school systems and their health systems and everything collapse, which led to a despair and a despondency, which some Scandinavian economists have said to me, they used to call Europe sclerotic, in America, because of its supply-side flexibility, would be more dynamic, and that was the growth model. But because of the pervasiveness of globalization, technical change, financialization, America is now in a position where the despondency, the temptation towards authoritarian politics and delusional scapegoating is not going to be the model of the future. We are not good. The way it was put simply to me by a New York Times reporter is when you go to Sweden, they love the robots because it improves the production possibility frontier. This, his name was Peter Goodman. It improves the production possibility frontier and the people in Sweden trust that while they don't save jobs, they save people. So that you and your children and your pension and your health and so forth would all be intact if you played the dynamic evolutionary game that America is not playing very well right now. And when I talk to the Chinese about exactly what you said, which is their market going through and up and out of the middle income trap, not the baby boomers like you and I, but that source of aggregate demand is the engine of growth in the next phase. And while I think you're right that they'll sputter and not reach the heights that they could by closing off, they feel that they can turn inward and exploit the economies of scale, invest much more in R&D, and that they're in, that in the medium term, they would assert, or at least before the last year, would assert that they were in pretty good shape and not going to kowtow to the American empire's leadership. I think they're half right. Uh, they... Uh, They can use their internal market, and they have they have created a vast and expanding middle class uh, because they've taken care of their people. Uh, in the Zhu Rongji years, uh, 1994 to 2003, uh, they lost 45 million jobs in the state enterprises, and most of those were manufacturing jobs but they took care of their people. Uh, virtually all of them got jobs in the service sector, which was the expanding sector. And those that didn't were retired on double pensions. Uh, now, the, the, the problem, so they, they've got the market. Um, their problem is gonna be on the supply side because as, as a recent book by Michael Enright showed, they are very dependent on foreign investment and, and foreign technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and their manufacturing 2025 bears a remarkable resemblance to the old Japanese industrial policy programs. Remember, we Americans were terrified that the Japanese were gonna take over the world uh, they had all these subsidies and, and reduced interest rates and, and uh, special protections. 
for their big companies. They, they were just going to be kings of every important sector. Now, what happened? Uh, they had a few successes, uh, mostly pretty much outside the, the uh, uh, special technology industrial policy sectors, uh, cars, uh, consumer goods, uh, especially consumer electronics, their subsidies for the big technologies uh, had some successes, very expensive, but they had more failures, uh, also very expensive. Uh, Merit Jano and Tom Pepper of the Hudson Institute did a book back in 1979 that added up the results and the results were uh, hugely negative for Japan. And, and the Japanese are very sophisticated, uh, much more sophisticated than the Chinese about industrial policy. The biggest Japanese industrial policy success was the fifth generation com computer artificial intelligence program. They were gonna take over the computer industry and artificial intelligence. <laughs> it has a remarkable resonance with today, even though that was back in the 1980s. Yep. And it was a complete disaster. Now, the same thing's gonna to happen to China. They're gonna have some big successes. And Alibaba and Huawei are extraordinary successes, uh, facilitated by the system, but not really the core of their of their manufacturing 2025 uh, uh, subsidies and protections. And, and the Japanese found something else. Uh, they, they put, as they turned inward, they, they protected their uh, cell phone sector by making sure that, that uh, their standards were completely incompatible with the uh, technology of Motorola, which was the big competitor. And uh, the protection was very successful. The Japanese got the, the domestic market all to themselves. But at the time, they had the five best cell phone companies in the world. And, and the, the turning inward meant that they turned the world market over to Apple and and Samsung and, and, and Xiaomi. So by protecting their own market, they, they lost the world market. And I, I think that's the, the uh, uh, fundamental lesson uh, for China. The lesson for the Trump administration is that this terror about manufacturing 25 is is inappropriate. We did it once before with Japan. We should learn that lesson. Uh, let the Chinese waste a lot of money. When they threaten to take over a particular sector through unfair means, as with Huawei or as with credit cards, we should block them in that sector. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't succumb to this existential terror that that the Trump administration uh, tends to spread. That leads me to the other point you made about our response to, to uh, the, the job losses compared with, with Sweden's. Uh, our response compared to the Chinese losses of 45 million jobs are, are, are even more dramatic a contrast. Now, now, what happened there? Mm -hmm. uh, manufacturing jobs have been in steady decline since 1947. I published a paper that has a graph. You can't even on that graph. You can't even see the emergence of globalization or of uh, China. Uh, it's just a steady decline since 1947. And our manufacturing output similarly goes up steadily from the post-war period. Uh, it goes up, but it uses a lot less fewer 
people, fewer jobs. Uh, and the reason is primarily technological change and organizational efficiencies. Mm -hmm. uh, it's true that, that globalization does affect some, some jobs. Uh, on the average, about one out of seven manufacturing jobs lost. Uh, but manufacturing jobs are going away that agricultural jobs once went. We used to have 98% of American workers in agriculture, and now it's closer to 2%. Mm. Uh, is that because Peru stole all our jobs? No, it's because we've got combines and all sorts of technologies so that one machine can do the work of 100 or 200 uh, previous workers. Now, when, man when agricultural jobs were declining, we built the Transcontinental Railroad system. We built the interstate highway system. We, we created the foundation of modern cities and mon modern manufacturing by zoning rules and, and uh, work safety rules and union rules, all sorts of things. Uh, we didn't blame foreigners. Now the same thing is happening in manufacturing jobs. The future is in service jobs, which on average are much, much better paid than manufacturing jobs. Uh, the Chinese recognize that, they shifted people. What's happened in our country? Well, the Democrats have their roots in the manufacturing unions. They're t totally dependent on them. So they talk about getting the manufacturing jobs back. They never talk about the fact that the, those manufacturing jobs are gone forever and you have to move people in, into service jobs. Uh, instead, you blame it on China. On the Republican side, the rationale is different. What we know from the work of people like MIT economist David Autor is that when you've got a company town and the company goes down, people just sit around helpless. They don't know what to do. These are not highly educated people who can scan the global market and see where the jobs are. You don't just have to offer retraining programs. You have to you have to identify where the jobs are going to be, mm -hmm. which is in services, and, and where physically they are, and help them. But that means giving the government some authority and some money. And Republicans are absolutely unwilling to do that. Yeah. So they also find it convenient. You're singing my song. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a boy that grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and uh, I watched the decline of the auto industry the outward migration of population. But when I talked, I used to, I worked for six years in the U.S. Senate. When I talked to the Michigan senators like Carl Levin and Don Regal, they said, well, after the Voting Rights and Civil Rights Act, no Democrats in the South are willing to provide trade adjustment assistance or economic adjustment assistance to a place like Detroit, which is a northern black run, meaning Coleman Young was the mayor, and black majority and so uh, Michigan, Detroit, metropolitan area are going to have to fend for themselves. And uh, we, saw, we saw what that implied. Yeah, uh, that's a perfect example. Um, Michigan governors and Michigan politicians rail against China as, as uh, having destroyed jobs in the, the car industry. The truth is exactly the opposite. Uh, GM was headed for the dustbin. Uh, at the turn of the century, GM was hopeless. It was a, a European and American car company. It was losing money hand over fist in Europe. It was losing money in huge amounts in the US. It was headed for bankruptcy and the loss of all those jobs uh, 
And we, when you include the supplier who would have been affected, it was millions of jobs. So what happened? China opened its market in a way that our allies, Japan and South Korea, never would. Mm -hmm. In China today, you can't drive anywhere without seeing a couple of Buicks. If you go to J Japan or South Korea, uh, you, you'll, you'll virtually never see an American car. But in China, they're everywhere. And the profits in China uh, were just enough to save GM. GM sells a lot more cars in China than it does in the US. Yeah. Moreover, the Chinese engineers re-engineered the styling of the Buick. Buick was headed for being Oldsmobile. Oldsmobile died because it was only being bought by people in their late 60s and 70s. Uh, Chinese made the, the styling a little sexier. And all of a sudden, Americans were buying, Americans under 60, were buying Buicks again. Now, now GM had lots of advertisements about European engineering. It wasn't European engineering at all. It was Chinese. Fashion. Now, on, the job, on the job front, when I was at RAND, Charles Wolf did a study of the effects of productivity on, on jobs uh, at, at General Motors. If productivity doubles and the number of cars uh, you're producing remains the same, then the number of jobs is cut in half. And so Charles did the calculation. Uh, how much should jobs have been reduced by the increases in technology at, 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 and productivity at, at General Motors? And what he found was the jobs should have gone down more than they did because of increasing productivity. And I asked why, why didn't they go down more? Well, they didn't go down more because the China market was supporting jobs that wouldn't have been there under ordinary circumstances. But the democratic politicians, in this case, they were Democrats, uh, uh, found it very useful to blame everything on China. And this is a very fundamental factor in our bad relationship with China today. Do you, uh, so we, we look particularly now at, at the horizon of the need to collaborate on a global level vis-a-vis -vis climate change. I think, the, I think the evidence that in the next 20 years, lots of things have to be done to transform the structure of energy use and reduce carbon substantially. We've been talking about a disintegrating relationship lost opportunity in the economic sphere from that disintegration or the pursuit of which I might call false or, or close to meaningless grievances in missing the big picture. But on the horizon, there is a big picture that will, will beckon us to collaborate with China. Do you see that as, as possible? And how, what's the pathway that you would envision to creating that necessary collaboration? Well, as you say, uh, global collaboration, and that means especially U.S.-China collaboration, is the only way we're going to solve the problem of environmental degradation and of climate change. And that collaboration was going very well. 
at the beginning of the Obama administration, China was a big problem in the world. Obama was very angry at them. By the end of the Obama administration, China was becoming a leader. And uh, we were, while disagreeing over the details, we were basically in sync. And the degree to which we were in sync is much more impressive when you go down to the technical level. Uh, Harvard has a uh, collaboration between uh, a, a group at its engineering school, a uh, group led by the guy who, who uh, solved as much of the Los Angeles air pollution problem as has been solved. And, and they work very closely with China uh, to, to try to help China uh, solve the terrible air pollution problem uh, that Beijing and other major cities have. Uh, and, and, and that's good for China. It's also good for us because the, the technical problems of solving air pollution are some of the most complex, difficult problems in, in science today. The, you push down one kind of pollution, you get another kind. Uh, uh, solve a problem in one area, worsen the problem in another area. And the mutual learning that has been happening by having some of the greatest scientists in the United States and China working together uh, it just can't can't be overstated. And it's not just Harvard and and the leaders. It's 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 scientists at all our major universities and in our government who are collaborating successfully on these programs. But what's happening now? What's happening is, is that the U.S. has gone from the lead, being the leader on the environment and on cl climate change to being the one that breaks the Paris Agreement and, and subsidizes the coal industry. Uh, while China has become the, the leader in every form of green energy and while it's digging itself out of a very deep hole, it's it, it's spending more on environmental improvement than all of the United States or all of Europe. And, uh, so at the top level, we've had a breakdown in collaboration and the paranoia that's set in from uh, Washington, which you know, there have been bad things happening. There have been Chinese scientists stealing our technology. But the, it's gone from, okay, this is a problem we neglected and we really got to solve it. And we really do have to solve it. There's some bad things that have been happening. But it's created a paranoia about all Chinese scientists. It's created special uh, investigations of very large percentage of people who happen to be ethnic Chinese. And the people are scared. Uh, uh, some of the best scientists are, are, are moving from the US back to China. Uh, and this, is, this is a terrible loss. You know, we did this in the, in the McCarthy era. We chased out one nuclear scientist and he went and invented the Chinese nuclear weapon industry. He was working for us. He wasn't doing anything wrong, but we, we, we drove him out. We're now doing this on a vast scale. Uh, people are spitting at Chinese on the street. Uh, the other 
the other aspect is crucial. It's crucial. You go to Silicon Valley and look at these giant companies that have made America the leader of the modern world. Everywhere you go in Silicon Valley, the founders, the leaders are Indian and Chinese. A few more Indian than Chinese. If we if we turn inward, uh, block immigration, drive out these entrepreneurs and scientists who are helping us be the leader in the world, uh, we're in trouble. So we have to get our balance back. I, I, I don't know how we do that. I think, uh, I think you're, you're really, I'm sorry, touching, touching on a deep fulcrum, psychological fulcrum that is haunting America a great deal right now. Peter Temin, who you know, the economic historian, Professor Emeritus from MIT, wrote a nine-hit book uh, 2016, early 2017, called The Vanishing Middle Class. And the underlying premise was that, as you said earlier, the new jobs are in the high margin services. And for people to get there, for America to be called the land of opportunity, we need from prenatal nutrition up through college education, the rungs in the ladder. And yet, where we see economic distress and despair geographically, we see the 70% of the population that is not in those high margin, high value added sectors, of which only about nine percentage points are African American. But we see the others voting and lobbying against something that would make a huge contribution to America being credibly called the land of opportunity. And it's in the poison vis-a-vis -vis scientists, it's in the poison of what my board member John Powell refers to as otherness, that as a society we are choosing in, in the realm of identity politics to break down our own system of opportunity. And we will not become vital and dynamic and realize our promise if we continue on that path. And the US-China relationship, given the size and scale of China, portends a lot of changes, not just how globalization and other things have affected the United States. But let's let give me your thoughts on, say, the development of Africa. INET did a conference in uh, December 2018 with Justin Lin, who advocates a new structural economics that was very much focused on the development of Africa and the role the U.S. plays as distinct from the role the Chinese play. How, how do you see that? Her, the horizon for African development uh, and the, the U.S.-China relationship in that context? Uh, let me talk about that, but let me first address the very important thing you said earlier, which is that as a society, we're voting against the things that would improve our situation. Why is that happening? People don't vote for Trump because they have calculated the economic interests of themselves and their families. Obviously they're voting against that. Why do they vote against these things? Well, they're, they're angry. They feel the establishment has deserted them. And they're right. 
it's not just Trump and the heritage people arguing for decoupling. It's Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and those politicians in Michigan that we talked about earlier that are refusing to deal with the major social problem of our, of our country in the new century. They're treating these people as flyover people in favor of short-term political calculations. Let's do, let's do ca- tax cuts for the rich rather than helping our, our, our left behind people. Let's, let's pander to the manufacturing unions rather than talking straight about where the jobs really are. Our whole establishment has abandoned the responsibility to take care of our people. And I know the people, the people are voting not against policies for education and health. They're voting against an establishment that they're angry about. Yes. And unfortunately, they're right. And nobody, nobody is standing up on either side of the aisle and saying, here's how we solve this great social problem. He's, here's how we move our society into the modern world and help all those struggling people. Until we have a leader who does that, we don't have a chance. Mm-hmm. Now, to Africa. In the old days, the U.S. was the promoter of a system of development, the, the strong World Bank, strong WTO, uh, strong AID programs, uh, uh, strong uh, institutional development programs, and in a place like Indonesia, those programs worked miracles. Indonesia in 1965 was the most hopeless place in the world. Negative economic growth, inflation in the multi-thousand percents, uh, more Islamic jihadis than the rest of the world combined. And, and we persuaded the new government under General Suharto to focus on the economy uh, we taught him how to do it. So the Berkeley Mafia became the ministers. The Harvard Institute of International Development provided the, the, the institutional guidelines. And Indonesia became a solid, uh, successful, uh, constructive member of the international community. It's now a democracy. Now, what do we do in Africa? Well, we didn't want to expand the World Bank and the, the IMF and the WTO. So we let those kind of atrophy. You know, we got rid of most of our aid programs. We got rid of virtually all of the institutional development programs. And the main thing we do in Africa is we provide a special forces team in each country to fight terrorists and and, uh, offshore naval presence uh, just in case there's a bigger problem. The ones promoting development are China. And and, uh, the last last big diplomatic and development success the U.S. had in Africa was under Republican George W. Bush, who put in tremendous resources behind a, a program uh, to s- solve HIV. Uh, and that did wonderful things for the people of many African countries. And it, it got America a huge amount of credit. Today, all, those, all they see is the special forces teams. And, and the special forces teams are are barely succeeding anywhere. They, like our forces in Syria and Afghanistan and Iraq, they, they never lose a big battle, but, but, but they never win the war. Uh, China, on the other hand, gets four dozen 
African leaders together and talks about development. And then it builds railroads and it builds roads and it invests. And Ethiopia has become the Chinese version of, of Indonesia under our successful programs. Almost nobody in the West realizes that in many years, Ethiopia is now the world's fastest growing country. When I worked in Ethiopia, it had six violently conflicting Marxist parties. Uh, it had one of the modern world's worst famines. This was a complete disaster, like Indonesia in 1965. And there are a number of contributors to excess, its success but China is the biggest one. And uh, if you look at the Belt and Road program throughout Africa, uh, there are a lot of problems. Uh, and American commentary is focused almost exclusively on the problems, which are real, but uh, we kind of like to belittle China. Hmm. But if you talk to economists who work systematically, and if you talk with Africans as a group, they say, well, the, for all the problems, this is huge progress for us. China, on balance, is, is helping, and helping a lot. So China's doing what we used to do, and it's the right program. And when our assistant secretary of state says they're just building a great wall of debt and trying to subordinate these countries, all American research has shown uh, that that's nonsense. They've handled debt problems roughly the way we would have handled them. The notable exception being uh, a big part in, in uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, so we've, we've passed the baton and we're surprised that, that somebody else picks up the baton. Yeah, I think, uh, that's, a, that's a, uh, that's almost a metaphor for <laughs> the entire American experience outside of the top 5% and the world experience. And uh, that's a daunting prospect. Bill, you lived in Hong Kong for 18 years. I remember we met when you were working with uh, Bankers Trust there, and, and so was I. There have been some big changes since the days of the British rule and Chris Patton and others. But it seems like things have become quite acute. A year ago, I was at a uh, Victor Fung event of his Asian Global Institute, and on the way to the airport, riding in a van with Kishore Mabubani, a bomb went off about 100, and, 100 yards at about 11 o'clock on the, on the clock as we were driving. A lot of the debris and so forth hit the car, and the driver just pulled around and kept going. Saw a bunch of people with those guy hawks type white masks all standing and cheering as they'd blown up a part of the road. But now it seems, I mean, we got to the airport, both of us were kind of terrified and, and went on home. Him back to Singapore and me, I went on to Beijing before New York. But uh, what's happening in Hong Kong now seems, what might say, even more profound or severe. I know you've written a recent paper on the uh, Hong Kong situation, but it, uh, it preceded this pandemic, uh, and it was called The Rise and Fall of One Country and Two Systems, which I'll post on our website uh, associated with this podcast. But uh, give me a sense. What's happening in Hong Kong? Is this a, a continuation of things that have been building? Is it aberrant? What does it imply for the people there and the world. 
Well, uh, until 2014, one country, two systems was working beautifully. The, the Chinese observed every comma of their promises to Hong Kong. Uh, uh, the British, by the way, earlier had not. They, they, they broke the agreement in, in, in very uh, important ways. But with the emergence of Xi Jinping, things changed. Uh, there were some booksellers in Hong Kong who were publishing books about Xi Jinping's love life. Uh, Beijing found a way to shut those down. There went freedom of publication. Um, the local uh, editor of the Financial Times was asked to chair a meeting of the Foreign Correspondence Club uh, where Joshua Wong, a, 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 a dissident uh, uh, high school leader had uh, spoke. And um, the Hong Kong government refused to renew his visa. So there went freedom of the press. And uh, one of the promises was that China would respect the Hong Kong judicial system and that organs of the, the government the mainland government would, would not interfere in Hong Kong. But, but there was a billionaire who lived at the Four Seasons Hotel and the Chinese Public Security Bureau made a deal with a local triad gang to kidnap him out of the Four Seasons Hotel and bring him to the border where the Public Security Bureau could, could uh, capture him. Uh, in addition, the uh, people from the Public Security Bureau were everywhere in Hong Kong, uh, contrary to the agreement. Uh, they, done, they didn't just uh, look at security issues. They, they were the arbiters of, of many locally important business deals. So China was breaking every major political agreement it, it had with China. And it was a very explicit policy, very explicit change under Xi Jinping. Uh, so then you get riots, uh, people react the way those bomb throwers you encountered did. And, and, uh, China could easily have solved this problem by saying, okay, uh, lower level people made mistakes. Uh, we're going to reaffirm uh, our promises and, and, and stick with them. Everything would have calmed down. We would have gone back to a situation where there were skirmishes along the boundaries of one country, two systems. China wants something to happen. People in Hong Kong don't want it to happen and have demonstrations. Under all previous Chinese leaders, there would have been calm discussions, negotiations, some kind of a deal. Uh, but instead, this time, China's reaction was uh, blame it all on the United States uh, and Taiwan. These are, this is always done all done by black hands, manipulated foreigners. They always had a hard time explaining how American CIA agents could somehow get a million or two million middle-class educated Hong Kong people into the streets, but that didn't bother them. They, they, they had wonderful propaganda 
uh, subcontracted, by the way, to to Russia. Uh, most of their their best propaganda videos were made by the Russians, uh, and they want to characterize even peaceful demonstrators as rioters. Uh, being a rioter makes you vulnerable to ten, to a ten year uh, jail term. And, they had somehow turned the very previously very respected Hong Kong police into a thuggish operation that, that operates the way police do on the mainland. Just beat the hell out of anybody who disagrees with you. Uh, so things, things were badly polarized. Uh, but these things could have happened one after another quickly uh, explosion came over what would have been a relatively minor issue by itself, uh, an extradition law uh, so that they could send, send a, a, a guy who had murdered his girlfriend back to, back to Taiwan. Uh, the, the big, the big riots before the pandemic exploded over that, uh, but it wasn't over that. It was, it was the, the pressure, the anger that had built built up over three years of China abandoning all its promises to Hong Kong. So then you have a pause for the pandemic, and then China wants to implement this new national security law. Now, the basic law, which Britain and uh, China and the Hong Kong leadership uh, agree, all agree to has Article 23, which says Hong Kong will pass uh, a national security law that prevents subversion. Uh, most countries have such a law. Uh, the, the Democrats uh, uh, opposed any kind of anti-subversion law uh, with a big demonstration every time there was a proposal to have one. And, and that was actually a big mistake. They should, have, they should have gotten together and said, well, here's the kind of, of anti-subversion law that would be acceptable to us. Though it's been, a, it's been an impasse for, for 23 years. So China finally said, uh, since you won't do it, we're going to impose one. So the problem is not the law itself, uh, the idea of an anti-subversion law, which is a mistake almost all of our media and politicians make. The two problems. One is that the proposed law uh, will have very severe penalties for for rioting and subversion and those are words on the mainland that are tr interpreted in the most expansive possible way makes it makes it possible to arrest almost anybody and and that's absolutely unacceptable to hong kong people the second is uh, that although china has a reasonable beef that Hong Kong has not lived up to its promise to pass an Article 23 law. It's illegal for uh, the National uh, uh, People's Congress to just impose a law of their choice on Hong Kong. And finally, the new law will allow uh, public security organs of China to function openly in Hong Kong. And, and that is specifically prohibited by another part of the basic law, which I mentioned earlier. So this is two things. One, one it's, it's a, a proposal that has absolutely unacceptable elements, and it's a trigger. It's a trigger for all the pent-up frustrations 
And this time it's not just triggering the frustrations in Hong Kong itself, but internationally. And uh, obviously the biggest response has now come from the Washington of Trump and Pompeo, who said that Hong Kong is no longer to be considered an autonomous entity. Um, yeah. Let me, yeah. Uh, if we have time, I'll step back for a minute and, and look at two sure. things. The, the fundamental conflict of view that underlies this and uh, the, the risks that are posed by the U.S. reaction. Mm -hmm. China's view of Hong Kong has always been that it's a business entity. Other Chinese cities or areas have a, a mayor, and a party secretary or a governor. China has a chief executive, whereas under the British it had a governor. That chief executive title is because Hong Kong is a business arm of China. The reason why China wanted to have to preserve Hong Kong system was so incredibly valued as business. Now, the Western view of one country, two systems is that it's a, it, it, it's a free liberal polity uh, with, with democratic potential. Uh, now, in the old days, uh, before Xi Jinping, Chinese leaders saw some connection between these two. Uh, Many top Chinese leaders talked about Hong Kong as a model for the future Chinese economy. Uh, they imported Chinese uh, Hong Kong advisors at, into very high levels, typically a deputy chairman of the bank regulator or deputy chairman of the, the, the securities regulator. Uh, and they saw a connection. Hong Kong represented a Western system that was very successful. It was an economic system that was very successful. And it had connections to these, uh, these kind of uh, political openness that they didn't completely buy into, but they saw as, as connected to the economic success. Uh, two things happened. In 2008, the global financial crisis disillusioned Chinese with the idea that Western financial systems were the way to go. No, this, was, this created a risk of total collapse. Uh, China needed to find its own way with, with more controls. Uh, Second, the advent of Trump and Bolsonaro in Brazil and Bolsonaro and Boris Johnson in Britain convinced not just Chinese leaders, but a broad swath of Chinese and many people throughout the world that democracy uh, created a risk of dangerous, ir irrational, uh, thoughtless leadership that would damage the economy. Uh, Chinese way seemed better. Um, I don't know, in comes Xi Jinping with his authoritarian tendencies and they say, well, uh, we're gonna preserve one country, two systems. And the important part, what they considered the important part was the economic system, uh, and we can get rid of this other stuff. Uh, so here's the clash that they think they're preserving 
the only important part of one country, two systems. And, and we think they're destroying the only, the only important part of one country, two systems. Now the, the Washington reaction, given that, that this Beijing government has broken so many promises to Hong Kong, the Washington reaction that it's no longer as autonomous as, as we thought uh, is completely reasonable. The question is what happens now? Yeah. If you take away the legislation that makes treats Hong Kong as autonomous. Uh, Hong Kong's role as a trading uh, center uh, collapses. Uh, Hong, Hong Kong's uh, uh, Hong Kong's foreign direct investment uh, system collapses. And if you apply the export controls to Hong Kong that provided to China, you're not allowed to transfer any sophisticated American computers to China. And this means, if it's interpreted this way, that we won't be allowed to sell any sophisticated computers to Hong Kong. And we'll enforce that on our European partners. Now, when I was in Hong, when I was a governor of AmCham in Hong Kong, uh, the calculation was that the big banks had to turn over their computer systems every two years. And if at the time we were legislating the special rules for Hong Kong, if the export controls had been applied, the big banks would have collapsed within two years. It's virtually impossible to replace their systems with uh, compliance with systems that they would be allowed to export or with or with systems bought from China. Now I don't know what the current situation is, but you have all the biggest American banks, all the biggest European banks, and the biggest British bank, HSBC. And while HSBC is legally headquartered in London, the, co the core of its business is out of Hong Kong. Are we gonna destroy all those banks? Uh, so the, how, how, if you're Pompeo and Trump, do you take this finding, which on its face is reasonable, and implement it in a way that doesn't destroy the livelihoods of the people of Hong Kong? Mm -hmm. In the Vietnam War, some of our soldiers had a slogan burn down the village in order to save it. If you burned down the village and killed everybody, they wouldn't become communists. Um, afterwards, some people thought that was a pretty bad idea. Uh, at, in the most extreme interpretation, just taking away the special protections of Hong Kong would burn down Hong Kong in order to save it. Uh, I don't know how much of our, our allies were consulted. Uh, the Trump administration doesn't have a very strong record in consulting allies. Have they talked about with, have they talked with London about the fact that uh, HSBC might, might be just crippled? Uh, I don't know the answer. Uh, but I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Well, these are pr profound changes in a very, uh, a very turbulent uh, time. Turbulent time. Bill, uh, any final thoughts? We, in many of these podcasts at this time, 
towards the end of May in 2020, I opened with a people's impressions of the profound influence and unmasking that the pandemic has provided. Do you have any final thoughts on how uh, how the pandemic has changed the forces in the context that we've been discussing today, US, China, Hong Kong, Africa, Asia, or, or any other observations that relate to it? Well, I think it has thing, changed things profoundly. Now, the, the whole world is angry at China because China is the origin of the, vi the virus and they were slow to respond and uh, we don't know whether they could have prevented the virus from getting out. This is a very, very fast spreading virus. But if there was a chance, they blew it. So the world is very angry at China about that. But then China cracked down. They did what you do to control a virus. Uh, they did what US plans would have done before Trump threw away all those plans of 2016. And then the Trump administration delayed considerably longer than China delayed. Uh, so now the US has been the center of the pandemic. Even if the Chinese figures for infections and deaths are off by a considerable magnitude, the U.S. has more, far more infections and far more deaths. So the U.S. is the super spreader of the virus to the rest of the world right now. And, and, and the way it first delayed for political reasons, Trump was afraid that the stock market would go down, so he called it a hoax. And, and then to this haphazard shutdown, all right? Every state is different. And then Trump, Trump mobilizes his own supporters against the shutdown and, and validates armed protesters intimidating the governor of, of, of Michigan. Uh, and now we have almost every state opening up before the guidelines say it's appropriate. So the US comes out as the big super spreader. And you know, there, there's this uh, uh, kind of silly effort by the government of Mississippi and voices in Washington say, we, we're gonna sue China for this boy. If, if, it, if we have a valid suit against China, and I don't know of any legal basis for that. Mm -hmm. uh, an awful lot of other countries would have a, a valid basis for suing us. And they're very, they're very angry at us. And instead of seeing us a, as a world leader, they see us as a joke. Uh, that, that along with abandoning the, the TPP and the Paris agreements and subsidizing coal have and, and ridiculing our allies about almost everything. Have, that provides the capstone of the end of our image as a valid world leader. Uh, and, and, China's got a big problem, uh, uh, but they can say once once we got our act together, we did we did what's right. We did uh, what was necessary to take care of our people. On the economic side, I think the consequences are very important. China had a huge problem, so it just clamped down. Uh, and, and the result, as did South Korea, Taiwan, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Germany, Austria, 
the result is they can open up their economies. Um, yeah. Well, I, th I want to thank you, uh, Bill, for this kind of vast and deep dive uh, on this on this day. And, and I think how I, I said at the outset, you have always been my teacher about things related to Asia, related to Myanmar, related to China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and much, much more. Your, your vision and insight with regard to uh, geopolitical forces, technological and military, as well as the kind of bread and butter of, of INET, the, uh, the economic dynamics is extremely helpful. And I hope that you, uh, before too much time passes, will come back. I mean, as I know you will do, we, we stay in touch and you'll always alert me if something acute is happening. I know my team at INET is very interested in doing a video webinar with you with our 11,000 strong Young Scholars Initiative and, and also the webinar for scholars and leaders that uh, has been blossoming. But for now and for today, I just, I wanna profoundly thank you. Your insights are very, very valuable, very considered. And you've always been someone who, uh, how do I say, is a guiding light in perhaps the most interesting and challenging frontier, this relationship between these two philosophical systems, these two large countries, and all that it portends. I hope uh, you enjoyed yourself. You certainly created a lot of things for people to think about for my listeners. So thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. It's, it's an honor to be part of your program. Yeah, it's continue to work with you. Yeah, you, you have been a core. You've been a featured attraction for a long time, and that's not about to stop. So <laughs> we'll talk again soon. And thanks again. Bye bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.